Go. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the In Memory uh, Virtual Chapter Session for, uh, for, uh, for, well, for August. It's the last day of August. But I almost said September, but uh, let's get started here. So some, some past community news here first for you guys. Uh, if you haven't registered for Summit 2016, make sure you uh, get those uh, registrations in. Uh, please use our local chapter discount code. It's down here in the bottom of the slide deck uh, for $150 off. You can't beat the experience of Summit. Uh, there's 200 plus technical sessions uh, there ready for you. Uh, networking opportunities with thousands of people from around the world. Uh, you, You'll, you'll be able to meet Sunil there, hopefully, uh, the speaker today, and countless other ones. Uh, make sure you, you make that trip. This is the last call for the uh, Passion Award nominations. This is the highest award for PATS. Uh, if you have somebody you want to nominate, fill out this form below and email it to passionaward at sequelpass.org. The winner is announced at Summit. The deadline is tomorrow, actually, so get them in today. Uh, we have a 24 hours of pass summit. Uh, sorry, 24 hours of pass coming up here soon. It's the preview of Summit 2016. Uh, it's coming up on September 7th, starting at new, uh, 12 o'clock UTC time. You get 24 hours of SQL Server and BI training for free. If you read, you can register there at 24hoursofpass.com. Here's some of the featured speakers on the right. Lots of big names in the community. Uh, some virtual chapter sessions coming up. Uh, Global Spanish meets on September 7th. Architecture meets on September 7th, DBA Fundamentals on the 13th, High Availability on the 13th, PowerShell Fundamentals as well. Women in Technology is on the 14th and so on you can see here on the list. Uh, if you haven't heard about the virtual chapters, make sure you get involved. We have virtual chapters just about for every topic you can imagine for SQL Server. Uh, data Science, Healthcare, Cloud, Business Intelligence, there's one for everybody. Make sure you check them out and join them if you want. They, have, they all have meetings at least once a month. Here's some upcoming SQL Saturdays for you. September 10th in St. Louis, uh, 17th in Charlotte. Here's my favorite one, October 1st in Pittsburgh. I'm actually going to be speaking at that local event. You want to come see me. Here's some international ones. Uh, the 3rd in Johannesburg in Oslo. Uh, Cape Town on the 10th in Cambridge. Make sure you check them out if you're able to. And as always, uh, PASS will not exist without volunteers. If you're if you're interested in volunteering to help out the PASS community, volunteer there at volunteer.sequelpass.org. You can check it out to see if there's anything local for you guys to do. Stay involved. You guys already have the free membership. You're already getting the emails. But you can check out our LinkedIn, our, our Facebook, our Twitter. And that's all for me. I am going to turn it over to Sunil. Sunil, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. There we are. All right. Uh, James, uh, thanks a lot. And please let me know if you can see my screen. Uh, we can see it. Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, welcome to all the attendees uh, on the call today and those who will be joining uh, me in a video uh, at a later time. Uh, PASS actually is a very special uh, organization for SQL Server team. I mean we have, like James was talking about, the community involvement, the real customers, real users who are helping us, you know, make this product better every day. And we value the commitment that uh, past members have for SQL Server and the feedback that they provide. So I hope this partnership goes from strength to even more strong uh, commitments. I think so. I'm really excited to be to be here. Uh, this talk today is about in-memory OLTP. Uh, most of you, I would think, will know that in-memory OLTP was first introduced in SQL Server 2014. I was uh, one of the uh, PMs who was involved on this technology from day one and it took us four years uh, to productize a 
technology that was developed by Microsoft Research. So the, the key point I wanted to impress upon here is that this technology uh, was in works in Microsoft Research based on the new hardware innovations and we productized and made it available in 2014. And when we brought this technology in 2014, it was not complete in the sense it did not support every bells and whistles that you have with T-SQL. We wanted to come out with a minimal set that could be used by our customers to run their transactional workload. We did not expect every workload will be migrated to in-memory OLTP, so that was not the expectation. And so we actually embarked upon a journey as part of 2014 that we will add more and more surface areas uh, to in-memory OLTP over next releases. So the 2016 is the next milestone in that development, and we're not done yet. We will continue to work on it. So, so that's a brief uh, background about in-memory OLTP. Uh, about myself, I'm with SQL Server team for the last 14 years now. Uh, I worked on um, data compression technology, always on, and then I worked on in-memory OLTP as part of 2014. And in 2016, my main focus was column store technology, which is in-memory analytics. So in this in this presentation, I have uh, 45 minutes. I wanted to uh, discuss, describe the concepts at a very high level. First 15 minutes, it may be a repeat to some of you, but I think it is important to understand what in-memory OLTP is all about. And then I want to show you a couple of demos to, to get the feel, the kind of performance that you can get out of in-memory OLTP. And then I will have a few slides to discuss what we have added in 2016 uh, so that people who knew about this technology but could not adopt this technology because of those limitations, they can take a step back and say, okay, uh, these were the blockers for me and they've been resolved, so I can now think about using, using this technology in, in, uh, in 2016. I work for SQL Tiger team now. I moved from the main product development team, and the Tiger team focus is just working with customers and making them successful. So it is my full-time job to work with you guys and make you guys successful with SQL Server technology. So if you have any issues, questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. My email is right there, and I'll be happy to help you out, either directly or indirectly by asking somebody else who has the expertise in this respective area. Okay, so the station objective I actually already talked about is uh, I'll give you an overview of what in-memory OLTP is all about and the scenarios where we are finding customers are using in-memory OLTP so you can say, okay, this is similar to something that I have, they so can use it and, uh, and also help you assess how in-memory can help you in your workload. And I'm hoping uh, after this short presentation, at least you have an idea why in-memory OLTP can deliver such a good performance. In fact, we have seen some workloads increasing in their throughput 30 times. In fact, I have one customer that had an increase in throughput 40 times on the same hardware. So the promise is huge but the mileage will vary, it depends on the workload, and we will touch upon that. So, so yeah, so understand why this technology can deliver such a huge value, and also where I can use this technology in my workload. Okay, with that, let me, let me go to the concepts. So, the basic premise of in-memory OLTP was that the hardware innovations, like if you look at the hardware machines today, you have amazing amount of physical memory available on a box. Windows Server 2016 can support 12 terabytes of physical memory on the box. SQL Server can support 12 terabytes of physical memory. I'm not saying all of us have that kind of a box available, but the key point is the, the hardware and the software can support amazing amount of physical memory, right? If you look at transactional workloads, right? 
majority of transactional workloads that at least I have seen uh, are under one terabyte. I mean the database size is under one terabyte. So here is the point. If my database size is under one terabyte, I could in theory you know, put the whole database in physical memory. All right? And by doing that, you'll get benefits. So for example, if you wanted to do queries, you know, index was fragmented or whatever not, you don't have to worry about incurring physical IOs because the data pages will be in memory, right? So we all understand that if I have a application, I'm running on a big physical box with a lot of physical memory, I will be able to get better performance because I do not have to do physical I.O., right? We still have to do I.O.s for checkpoints and for transaction log, right? That makes sense. So, so I think the key point I'm trying to say here is that your database being in memory will give you performance benefits. But the key is even if your database is in memory, it is not optimized for in memory. Okay, and what I mean by that, okay? So let me show you a simple uh, visual, which I think will, will resonate here. So what I'm showing you here is a simple non-clustered index on, let's say, on a table, employee table, right? So if I have a query which says, find me the address of an employee where employee ID is XYZ, right? So let's say you have this kind of query run very often. Any DBA, would what they would do, they will create a non-cluster index on employee ID, right? Because based on the query workload, you decide which indexes to create. Now imagine and assume that everything is in physical memory. Just assume that, right? So the way uh, when you run the query, right, give me the address where employee ID XYZ, uh, optimizer will figure out, well, there is an index available, let me use that index. So assume this yellow index that I'm showing you is the index that is on employee ID. So now, since the data is staying in pages, so what happens is uh, SQL Server will pick up the root page, right? It picks a root page and then figures out, should it go to which page it has to go to the to find this employee ID, right? Uh, it's a B tree, not a binary tree, so there are multiple pages. So so it it reads the information, figures out which is the next page it needs to go to. So what it is showing you here is it needs to go to the leftmost page on the level two. So now let's just think about what SQL Server does. It latches a page, the root page, searches that page, reads the information, and then unlatches the page and then goes to the next page, right? So he's going to the next page and repeats the process, right? Okay. And then it goes to the leaf page. So there it found the record which says employee ID, whatever you were looking for, if it was available, right? Now in SQL Server, and I think in most uh, database, uh, commercially available databases, a non-cluster index typically is built on top of cluster index, right? So this leaf node that I'm pointing out is going to point to a cluster index root page and then we will traverse down the cluster index root page. So the point I'm making is that even though if I assume my database was in memory, even though my data that I was looking for, which is the employee record, is in memory, but I'm really going through eight or nine halves to get to that page, right? It's almost like if you want to go from Oakland to San Francisco, you are going via Boston, right? I mean, you could have just gone across the Bay Bridge and you are there, but you are going via Boston, right? That, uh, so that's the problem, that it is data is in memory, but it is not optimized for memory. And what in-memory OLTP has done, because we can assume the data is in memory, that's an important assumption. So what we have done, and uh, as a simple example, we create a hash index instead of a B3 index, hash index on, in this case, I'm saying name, but assume it is employee ID. And then what I do is, if I say employee ID XYZ, I hash on that value and I directly go to the row that I was looking for. In this case, the row was the R3 row. Sorry. 
So this is the row that I will go to. So the point I'm making to you is now imagine going from Oakland to San Francisco via Boston. I skip that. I directly go to San Francisco crossing the Bay Bridge, right? I directly access the row. So here is the benefit. We are able to use structures, in this case hash index, that has been optimized for the fact that the data is in memory, right? So because of that, this access is super, super fast compared to going through the B3 structures, okay? So that's key thing to remember is that with in-memory OLTP, not only your data is in memory, but it is optimized for memory, okay? That's the key point. So let me go back to the pillar that we have. So one key pillar is that the data is optimized for in-memory access, right? The requirement that we have is the data that you want to put in memory, uh, mark as an in-memory OLTP table, it must reside in physical memory in its entirety. It cannot be paged out, okay? So that is one requirement. And I'm going to touch upon this topic in the next slide, okay? Now, uh, it is optimized for memory direct pointers. We just talked about, you know, going from hash index to the row directly. Now, interestingly, uh, because the data is in memory, you don't have to worry about pages. So there are no pages. Um, I'm saying in a very um, uh, strong way, there are some examples where we need pages, that is for the range index, but let's not worry about that. Majority of the data for in-memory OLTP tables is not based on pages. It is sitting only in memory, right? Which means no buffer pool. That means no latches, right? Because there are no page, there's no latch. And also there is no write ahead logging and so on. There are a lot of benefits of assuming the data is in physical memory. So you can imagine SQL Server did a lot of work to work through these changes in, in what in memory actually brought us uh, uh, to, uh, in a lot of changes to make this happen. Now the second thing which is important is uh, if you look at the normal stored procedure, right, it is, you know, compiled, optimized, and when you compile and optimize a stored procedure or a query, and if you look at it, what you get is a query tree, right? You will see, for example, if I was doing a join between two tables, say I say select star join from these two tables, if you look at the query tree, you will see select node, you will see a join node, and then you will see a scan node, one for each table, right? So these are the operators, these are at the high level operators that are executed by the query execution engine, and it works fine. What we did with in-memory OLTP was we took this high level tree, if you will, and transformed that tree into a C program. Now let me repeat that, it's actually pretty innovative. We took that high level tree and almost like did a code generation that you see in a compiler course. I mean if you have done a compiler thing, you, you converted that into a C program and then we compiled it using C compiler. So what you got is a binary code using uh, a binary code executing the same logic that SQL Server would execute using the high level execution tree, right? So by doing this, the number of instructions that are needed to execute that logic is much, much less than it is without it. In fact, what we found was um, we did some sort of a testing with a DPCE kind of benchmark uh, stored procedures. We found that using the combination of in-memory optimized structures like hash index, and this natively compiled stored procedures, we were able to reduce the instructions X needed to execute that transaction by 50 times. What it means is that we took 50 times less instructions, that means it can finish 50 times faster, right? Because clock cycle, whatever it is, very important. Now, the third thing which is important is the blocking and locking. Now, if you look at the new hardware, we talked about a lot of memory being available. There is also large number of sockets and cores available. I mean, you can buy uh, CPUs with, say, 
four sockets and uh, 128 cores or even eight sockets and large number of cores. Now all these cores are good, right? I mean they can process. But the problem is if your workload is running into a lot of locking and blocking, if you have 256 transactions running in parallel at the same time, you will see a lot of locking and blocking and they will not be able to use the CPU cycles available because they'll be just waiting because of being blocked. So one of the things we wanted to do with 2014 in Memory World TP was provide a optimistic concurrency control so there is no locking blocking, okay? So by removing the locking blocking, now you can imagine you can scale almost linearly because no transaction is waiting. So you may wonder, um, hmm, if they are, why would they not block? Because if, I, if I'm changing a row and you're changing a row, of course we need to block, right? That kind of thing. So here's the interesting point. In a transactional workload, most of the time, people do not block each other on a row. I'll give you an example, right? Suppose you and I have a bank account, say, in Wells Fargo. You are uh, making a deposit and I'm making a withdrawal from my account. So you and I are not really conflicting on that row because each of us have a different account. However, it is possible that your account row and my account row happens to be on the same page in a traditional uh, table, right? If they happen to be on the same page, if I want to make a change, I need to latch. And let's say you latch, I need to wait because once you're done, then I go back in, right? So you can see that there was a lot of blocking because of latching. And since there's no page, there's no latching. And, and, and as I talked about, there is no really a uh, conflict. Now here is the other interesting thing, right? In a, in a traditional locking mode, right? Let's say I was the only user in the system. I'm just making a simple example, only user. I was making changes to one million rows, right? Forget about lock escalation, right? If I'm making changes to one million rows, I have to lock the row, make the change, unlock the row, right? I'm taking locks million times and I'm removing locks million times, right? Now, in optimistic control, because we do not lock, I'm saving all this locking and unlocking of the rows, right? And, and uh, SQL Server 2014 in memory old TP deals with the conflict in a different way. Uh, it basically figures out that uh, at a very high level, conceptual level, the way it does is, it looks at the state of the rows when the transaction began, and it looks at the state of the rows when the transaction is about to commit, and sees if anybody changed the row that I changed. If it did, it will abort that transaction, right? Just like a deadlock thing. But we believe that thing happens in a much rare way. So, so it's a not a major concern. Of course, some workloads do have conflicts and they have to make some changes, but the key point is the conflicts are rare, so you save on the locking and unlocking uh, um, code, which is not needed for most cases. So, so these are the three key changes that we did with in-memory OLTP. Now, the final thing which is important is we did not really create a new SQL Server or new engine. It is part of the same SQL Server. That means you have a database and uh, you have some in-memory tables. The way you look at the object explorer, the SSMS or the backups and the log, whatever you do, it is the same SQL Server. You don't even have to worry about as a DBA, if I'm doing a backup of my transaction log, what happens to my in-memory tables. All those things are happening behind the scene in an automatic way. So the key point is there's no new learning. It is the same SQL Server. It's just that it has a new engine inside it that you don't see uh, that is optimized for in-memory OLTP. Okay. So so let me let me quickly show you uh, one visual which is actually important. So here uh, I have a a, a database. Here I'm showing you a database with three tables, right? T1, T2, T3. And you can see that I show the indexes, which are like the crisscross thing that you see indexes on T1, T2, and T3. And this is the state of the table in the buffer pool. Of course, we only have pages in the buffer pool that are needed from those tables. And those tables are uh, on the disk as well, right? So this is how they uh, live. 
and on the left side you see a transaction log so you have a file group for tables and the file group for transaction log right okay now we provide out of the box a tool which is integrated with SSMS which you can use to figure out which tables and even stored procedures could benefit from the in-memory OLTP. So let's say we get the tool and we decide that two tables T1 and T2 can benefit within memory OLTP. Why? Because they were running into a lot of locking blocking. Right? Just assume that. So we essentially move those tables from the page based structures into the red zone which is in memory representation of the data which is we talked about the hash indexes and so on. Just assume that the data move from there. Now there is no easy way to move the data like you cannot say alter table T1 make it in memory you cannot do that I mean that is something that we need to look at you need to make a physical copy of the data and then drop the original table so you have to do some renaming stuff right so there is it's a bit more complicated process but it's a data movement so you do that and and notice one thing that when we have a storage, notice the storage for in-memory table is a little different because it is not page-based, so we have a special file group that is for the whole database which we call in-memory, memory optimized file group. So the table stays there. So here is one difference which is I think important to note that the index is not persisted. So any index that you create on memory optimized table, in this case T1 and T2, there is no persistence of that index. We keep the index only in memory. Okay? And when you restart SQL Server, we will generate those indexes on the fly and it is actually because it is not logged, it is um, very different, it can be loaded almost at the speed of I.O. So here's the benefit. Since the, the index is not in memory, that means if I insert a row, let's say I insert a row into table T1, and let's say originally I had five indexes on the table, a insert of a row in a table T1 will also cause us to insert five rows in those indexes and they need to be locked, right? So you will be generating at a minimum six log records, right? But here with the in memory because trans, uh, indexes are not persisted, you do not generate those log records. So you can see we are writing less number of logs. In fact, transaction log management has been a bit more optimized for in-memory tables. So you can uh, do higher uh, level of transaction throughput. Now one thing that you can do is you can choose uh, a non-durable option. Now what it means, when you, when you create a table, right, uh, a common confusion is, hey, it's an in-memory table, what happens if my system crashes or I restart my SQL Server? Now out of the box, when you create an in-memory table, it is durable just like your traditional table. Okay, we actually call those tables as disk-based tables and, and in-memory tables. Okay, they are fully durable. They have full asset properties, so you can uh, roll back a transaction, you can commit a transaction, and then you restart. We are guaranteed that you will get the data back. But there are cases where you don't need persistence. I'll give an example. If you do an ETL, you're getting data from external file, putting to a staging table. And from staging table, you move to the target table. right? And if, suppose, system has to restart, you can deconstruct those staging tables from the files that you got. right? So here is one example where you don't really need persistence. But SQL Server does not provide you any option to declare a table as non-persisted. Yes, you can do tempdb, but it's still tempdb has persistence. So, so, so you can mark a staging table as in-memory table and say it is non-durable. So if I mark this table as non-durable, then there is no persistence. Like you can see that table T2 in this case, I took it away from the persistence. That means it is not persisted as data, nor as log. Okay. Now, so let's say I move my tables to in memory tables. Now my queries and my stored procedures will continue to run as before and that's the mode we call interop. So they are not, uh, you remember talking, talking about native stored procedures which are compiled into a C program 
that's a stage two. The stage one is you moved your tables to in memory and your ex existing code will continue to work like before. There are some exceptions, but, but that's a basic idea. And now if you want to do the next level of optimizations, you can convert those stored procedures into native stored procedures and then you can get even better performance okay so so on that note let me let me move forward and show you uh, how it is done all right so so I think we talked about like uh, in memory OLTP because we have optimized structures lock and latch free structures we can get much much better performance and these are the performance numbers that I'm showing you in the column two we can get up to 30x better performance and some of the numbers that we got when we were running testing on a four socket server that you see here we can ingest 10 million rows per second if you think about 10 million rows per second fully logged is a huge huge number we can generate one gigabyte of log per second and we also try to test with a, a, a sort of a, a uh, order processing workload simulation and we were able to run 360,000 transactions per second. So, so the key point is that we can, using in-memory OLTP, can deliver amazing amount of performance um, uh, for your workload. And one actually our uh, flagship uh, customer example that we have been using for a few years, it is a pretty compelling example. It was a, a online betting company, Beaven Party. And uh, they actually had a session state server uh, using ASP.NET. They uh, had 18 SQL servers before they moved to in-memory world, 18 SQL servers uh, who uh, they were managing sessions. So like you log into their website, you will be directed to one of those uh, servers, and then your session is managed for the duration of the server's uh, life. They had to do this because they were, you know, sessions, they were doing lots of inserts, updates, and all kinds of stuff. So they were getting a lot of locking, blocking, and they had scaled out the solution. It was working for them. But they were concerned as, you know, the workload increases, more users come online, they have to keep managing more and more servers, right? With in-memory OLTP, they moved all those tables for session state into in-memory OLTP table and they were able to consolidate 18 servers into one. And I think the performance gain they got was uh, around 20x. And we have done the testing, we actually have been improving this technology over time. In 2016, they did a benchmark with us in the lab last year and they're able to do 1 billion requests per second in testing. So, so the key point is, the, the the value of this technology is that you can get huge amount of performance which is good you can also simplify your infrastructure you don't have to have multiple servers right which means multiple licenses multiple physical boxes and so on and so forth now in terms of the uh, technology let me show you uh, some key things how do you create a memory optimized table stuff like that right so let's just walk through that in a very high level so here is a table, it's a create table customer, right? Now this table definition that I'm showing you, it is showing you a memory optimized table. So for example, we have to say, you can see that create table looks like any other SQL statement, but we have to say this is a memory optimized table. That means SQL Server knows that in my database, this table is memory optimized. What it means is that this table must live in memory. Okay, it's not like a pin table scenario because pin table is completely different stuff and in fact SQL Server does not support that anymore. But uh, you can think of that in this database, this table that I have customer will be in memory for its lifetime, right? There can be other tables in the same database that are not memory optimized, so they will be just like before, right? So one of the things we are saying is you only move performance critical tables into in memory, right? So if you have a database, say, say one terabyte, and you say, well, I have only 256 gigabyte of physical memory, what do I do now? Well, I mean, think about this, right? You may not have all tables that are performance critical. You pick or find, say, two or three tables that are performance critical. You just move them to in memory, right? So yes, it will take some physical memory, but not 
you don't need one terabyte okay so that's the memory optimized table and second thing you can say this is actually a default that durability is schema and data what schema data means that um, uh, when you restart your SQL server the table will live the way you created the table and the data will live the way you loaded the data right so this is a default option you can choose you can say uh, in this case I'm going to go up a little bit you can choose that the durability is schema only that means it is like a non durable table we talked about in the staging table so this will only materialize the schema but not the data now this is actually an important point think of tempdb right when you create a table in tempdb okay and you restart your database or you restart your sql server the table that you created is gone right schema definition is gone you have to recreate the table the durable the non durable table for memory optimize is persisted in the schema that means when you restart your sql server even if you have loaded say 20 rows in your non durable table when you restart the table will be there but not the rows right so it's a schema only so that's are the two modes we support now you can also create a table type like here is a create type of um, memory optimized table and you can say memory optimize on this is actually important I'm going to show you a quick demo on TempDB how this is useful now for the stored procedure right you are writing say create procedure whatever right business logic <coughs> you can say that this stored procedure is native compiled that means it has to be transformed into a C program and and do that so if you forget about the header that I have here but pretty much like the T SQL goes here and behind the scene the SQL server will manage that so you don't have to worry about uh, how this will all happen and stuff like that so it is pretty much uh, like a stored procedure for you you can even create functions you can say you know this is something if you knew in 2016 you can say I'm going to create a function with a native compilation on right so this is all about memory optimized tables right so one thing I would say the native stored procedure that we talked about they can only reference memory optimized tables okay this is a limitation at this time you cannot have a native stored procedure that is referencing a memory optimized table and a traditional disk based table okay currently you can have only uh, it can only reference uh, memory optimized tables okay now uh, we talked about the 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 durability right the default uh, durability of memory optimized table is key mind data right and and this is pretty much what we recommend to our customers the other option we talked about was a non durable table which is um, schema only and it is actually common cases uh, like a session state server we talked about even they were using a non durable uh, memory optimized tables because if system has to crash they uh, yeah the session is lost i'm not saying it's a it's a good customer behavior but it's one of those rare things so they said they made a call saying we will have it non a durable table and the third option is a delayed durability what is a delayed durability is a commonly confusing item the delayed durability says that you know traditionally what happens when you commit a transaction you say you know I deposited hundred dollars to my account I say commit right we the the ATM machine or the transaction processing system will not say you are successful until it is guaranteed that the transaction log made it to the disk right that's a common way to guarantee the durability now uh, imagine this if you're running in a system which has log um, bottleneck I mean because we are waiting for all these commits they could be like a, a latch wait at the log page right so uh, but that's the way it is right but there are certain situations where you may not care about the exact durability so hear me out on this one so let's say I'm capturing the data which is you know like um, let's say meter reading uh, or I'm mo monitoring a a factory floor and I'm capturing the data that is coming from from the production machines on the factory floor right it is collecting like every 10 seconds some data and it's collecting data from multiple machines right now 
what delay durability says is as soon as the transaction says commit, we will say transaction committed, but we do not flush the log to the disk. Okay? So that means if system has to crash, you will lose some data, right? Because we did not flush the log to the disk. Now, this delay durability option that is available both for disk-based tables, traditional tables, as well as memory optimized tables, and it can be used for certain scenarios where you can tolerate certain data loss, like the example I was giving about the factory floor. So that is something available uh, to you. So there are three durability options, right? Schema and data, which is like what we know and love today, uh, schema only, and the delayed durability. Now let me show you a quick demo of the power of memory optimized table. And good thing is that all this demo that I'm going to show you is available in the source and you can download this one. Okay? And the slides will be available to you. So let me let me go to the demo. Okay. So here I'm gonna run this demo. I'm gonna go here and this is the application. So what this application is, it is actually a order processing application where there are multiple threads that are inserting rows into a table. Just think of an order processing application, okay? And I'm going to restart this application. This is currently running on a disk-based table. So can I start this application? And you'll see it is getting some transaction throughput, right? I'm getting around four or 5,000 transactions per second. And if you look at the diagnostics, right, it is getting a lot of latching here, right? Because I'm getting that many latches per second. And you see the CPU utilization is around 65%. So I'm going to stop that, right? So when I look at this application, I know that I'm getting a lot of latches and I'm not able to drive my CPU to 100% because I'm getting blocked by latches, right? So now what we will do, we will take this application and I'm going to convert just a table, okay? The table into in memory, right? This is my database. So I'm going to t delete the ticket reservation detail table, which was disk based table. And I'm going to create a memory optimized table, right? I'm just going to do that. So what I did here now is I said, okay, I'm going to take that table. I'm going to move that from disk based state to the in memory state, okay? I just did that. And I'm going to run the same application again, right? I started. And you will see now it is in memory and suddenly my CPU utilization is 100% and I'm not getting any latch, right? So here I'm getting a, a, a gain, uh, 2 to 3x gain uh, in my workload just by moving the table to in memory. And you see the reason because there is no latching now, right? Now let me make one more change. I go back to my screen and notice here the durability was schema and data, right? So I'm going to change this table, I'm going to drop this table, and I'm going to make the durability as schema only, okay? So I just now, it's a schema only. So that means any inserts that I'm doing are not going to get logged, right? So I'm going to run this guy. And you will see some improvement, right? I'm seeing a little bit more improvement, and that is because whatever bottlenecks I was getting in my workload throughput because of transaction log is gone, right? Okay. Now the final thing that I will do, which is the stage two I was talking about, was to convert the stored procedure from traditional stored procedure to the native stored procedure, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop that procedure. I drop this here. And then I'm going to create the same procedure, same logic, but notice I'm saying it is native compilation, right? I'm seeing native compilation here. Okay, so I come here and uh, and I go, go here. And, and uh, so now what I've done is I've taken the old procedure and I made it native. And now if I run the workload, it'll go even faster, right? And you will see because it is running native, right? So, so I'm going to stop here. So the key point is that you can, you can get huge improvement in your throughput and even the response time because you know you're running much less number of instructions by moving a subset of tables that are performance critical to in memory okay so with that I hope I convinced you that it is possible number one 
and in many cases it is not that hard. I'm not going to say here and that, hey, this is all piece of cake. I mean, you have to look at the application and see what you can migrate and stuff like that, right? But the key point is it's a huge potential uh, uh, to have this kind of a gain uh, to your applications, okay? Okay. Now, let me, let me touch upon at a very high level when should we use in memory tables, right? Okay. Now, we only recommend for transactional workload. Right? If you want to increase the transaction throughput, yes, in-memory OLTP is absolutely needed. You want to improve data ingestion rate. That means I want to load data at a much faster pace. You can use in-memory table. We talked about uh, the staging table scenario. And also, in many cases, I mean, I'm sure you have seen examples where you have a table with a cluster index and the data is coming in the cluster and key order by multiple threads. You get a lot of lock, latching blocking, and, and those kind of things go away with in-memory table. Reduce latency, right? Why? Because you are executing less number of instructions to do the same thing, so that means your transaction will go much faster. In fact, many of our customers had the latency requirement and they moved to in-memory OLTP to reduce the latency of their transactions. Like, you know, think about telecommunication, think about financial institutions. And, of course, um, if you don't have locking, blocking, you won't have the spikes, right? Because um, as, you know, concurrency increases, you can see the impact on the workload scenarios, right? Now, we don't recommend using in-memory tables to improve the performance of BI, right? This is not a, uh, we have not designed in-memory OLTP for BI kind of workloads. For that, we have a column store. In fact, in 2016, you can create a column store on top of in-memory table, so now you get best of both worlds. You get transactional throughput, high throughput because of in-memory OLTP, and because you have a column store sitting on top of in-memory table, you can get much, much higher. Uh, better uh, analytics performance. Now, the second point is important. If the performance bottleneck is outside of SQL, now think of this, right? Let's say SQL Server in memory world TP can improve performance, say 10x. Let's say that. Now, if I was looking end to end transaction time, let's like say when the time I'm sitting on my terminal or application, I type whatever in, uh, transaction workload I have, and I time I get the response. So let's say that is 100 units, right? It takes 100 units to get the response back. If 90% of my 100, 90, 90 units of that time is being spent inside SQL Server, and I move that to in-memory OLTP, 90 becomes, we were talking, say 10x, will be done in 9 units, right? So that means my transaction can finish in 19 units now, right? From 100 to 19. So it's a 5x improvement. But if my time spent inside SQL Server was only 10 units, and I make it 10 times faster, so it'll be 10 times becomes 1, 1 unit, right? So it'll become 1 plus 90, 91. So the point I'm making is, if you have a very chatty application where you know, you're spending a lot more time outside of SQL Engine, don't expect that application to improve better because you know, most of the time you can spend outside of SQL Server, that is not really uh, visible to in-memory OLTP. You see that? So, so, so that uh, I think is something uh, to, to, to note. Okay, now the, the next thing I want to show you is common scenarios, okay? Common scenarios, we touched upon a little bit. Common scenarios are a high transaction uh, throughput and low latency requirement. This is something you should think about using in-memory OLTP. The data load, uh, we call it shock absorber because data can come in in burst and with in-memory OLTP because it is not locking, non-blocking, you can handle those bursts in a much even fashion. Session state server, ETL, and finally the TempDB replacement. Now this is actually something many people do not know about and I want to show you a quick demo on how you can replace some of the TempDB constructs using in-memory OLTP. Okay? Uh, I have literally uh, five, ten minutes, so let me quickly show you the demo. So I go here, and what I want to show you is um, that I have this database, and um, I'm going to create uh, a, a table variable of type traditional table, which you are saying test disk, which is here. And uh, 
and I'm going to create a table variable of, let me create that here. And same thing for the memory. Notice here I'm saying this table variable is drive memory optimize on, right? I create that. Now I'm going to run a, a simple statement. I think this is important to show here that I have a declaration of a table a table type, uh, disk based, and what I'm doing is I'm inserting two values and then I delete those values and I do this thing 10,000 times, okay? So I'm going to make it 1,000 here because I think it takes a little longer, so I'm going to run this guy, okay? And notice this is table variable, I'm going to run this, it should take 4 to 5 seconds here, okay? It completed in 1 second, let me do 10,000. Uh, let's see, test disk. Uh, this morning when I was trying, it was taking like some 30 seconds, so I said, let me not do it. Okay. So it should finish in 30, uh, 3, 4 seconds, right? Let's see. So I think it will... Neil? Yeah. Uh, yes. While we're waiting for this to complete, there's a question that has come up um, already twice, and maybe this will be a good time to explain. Sure. So, so some people... Um, don't understand what's the difference of the in-memory concept of um, Hecaton or in-memory OLTP versus column store indexes. Okay. Um, so right. If you can give like, you know, a quick two minutes, this let has me do that. A, a recurring yeah. uh, question. All right. Thank you. Let me, let me answer that question. For, let me first show you. It took like 14 seconds to finish that. And notice if I'm going to do the same thing with an in-memory table type, I'm going to go 10,000. And you will see this will go much, much faster, right? It went in one second, so 10 times faster. So here's the point, that a table variable of type memory optimized can go much, much faster. So now how can I use it? And uh, I'm going to show you this simple example, that I have a stored procedure, which is a common thing that you will see in many stored procedures. So I'm going to drop the stored procedure. And notice what I have in the stored procedure. I declared a hash table or a pound table, right? So you have a stored procedure, then you have a pound table, and in that pound table you are, you know, going to do inserts, deletes, updates. So here what I'm doing in that pound table, in this stored procedure, I'm inserting 100 rows, right? This is a stored procedure. So basically what you have is a stored procedure which creates a pound table, inserts 100 rows, and the stored procedure is done, okay? Now I'm going to run the stored procedure using OSTRAS. I mean, uh, I don't know if you guys have tried OSTRAS. It's a pretty amazing uh, tool. You can run, in this case, I'm running a stored procedure execution, SPTEM, you know, uh, 25 threads, each thread runs 100 times. So basically, I'm running this stored procedure 2,500 times, right? Let me run this guy. Run this guy, and you will see that pound table thing, it took me 2.6 seconds to finish the whole thing, right? It's pretty good. Now what I'm going to do is, let's say I want to move away from this pound table and I want to use non-durable table for memory optimized tables, okay? So I'm going to I'm going to drop that sort procedure, right? SP temp that I had. Actually, I'm going to create a new sort procedure, DBO temp1. And uh, actually, I step back. So this was a table that I'm creating. It's a table type that I create, right? And then I'm going to drop that sort procedure SP temp here. I drop that procedure. So this is now going to use the new definition, which instead of pound table, notice instead of pound table, I'm using a table variable which has been defined with memory optimized thing on. Right? Let me just go up so that it is clear. I declare a table type temp1, and that's the variable that I'm using. Okay? So I'm going to go here, and uh, I'm going to do Okay, so now I replace my SP temp to use, instead of pound table, I'm going to use memory optimized table. And if I go back here in this tool, and I run this guy, temp, run, and you will see it ran in 1.079 seconds, right? So it is 2.5 times faster than if I was using pound table. So here's the point, right? By this technology, you can not only get rid of those pound table usages, you can get even better performance, right? So, so, so it's a very important uh, usage of memory optimized table, which is not shared or known uh, in general. Okay. Now, let me answer the question about the column store and in-memory OLTP. So, so the way I think about, right? In-memory OLTP is for transactional workload, 
and the column store is for analytics, right? You are doing like large number of rows, you are doing aggregates, for example, show me the sales by the quarter for this product. Those are not OLTP kind of queries, those are analytics kind of queries, right? So when we say, so this is actually a confusing topic, when we say in memory analytics, we imply column store, in memory OLTP we imply Hackathon. So the difference in the technology is this, right? Remember like in the in memory OLTP, we do not have pages, right? We are storing rows as just rows as C structures in memory. With the in memory analytics, the column store data, what we do is we compress them in a different way. So what we do is we instead of storing data as rows, we store as columns. So col if you have a table with five columns, C1 through C5, we store column C1 as one unit, column C2 as different unit, and we compress it. Typically, we get 10 times compression. And that data that is stored on disk, it is stored in pages, okay? It's like a lot of pages. So it is a different way to store the data and a different way to structure the data. Now, when you want to run the query, because data has been compressed so well, you run it, many times the data is actually in memory because it has been compressed 10 times. So at some level we call it in-memory analytics. And so that is completely different technology than in-memory OLTP. Both are actually very useful. One gives you very good performance for the transactional workload. Other one gives you very good performance for your uh, analytics workload. Um, I hope that answered the question. Um, I know I'm rushing on that part. Um, just a quick add to that, um, there was a question whether you can create column store indexes on uh, hackathon tables. And the answer is yes. And the answer is yes. So this is something that we allow in 2016. Oh, and okay. I didn't yeah. know that. That's yeah. news. That's good news for me. Right. Okay. That's right. So basically what we are finding is this is actually a very interesting scenario for us which is real-time operational analytics because a lot of times uh, what people do is, you know, like if they run the transactional workload on one box, they do ETL every night and do analytics on a different box, right? Now, the reason they do that is because they want to keep the transactional workload separate from the analytics workload, right? Now, with the technology in 2016, we are recommending for many, many workloads, instead of doing ETL and analytics on a separate box, why don't you create a column store index on your transactional workload? Now you don't have to do ETL, now you can keep running your transactional workload like before and you can do analytics in real time because you don't have to worry about data moving from your transactional workload to the analytics every day which is like one day too late, right? So, so that is there. I know I'm, my time has run out. There are many improvements we have done. This slide deck will be available as an upload. Uh, and which uh, there are many changes that we have done from 2014 to 2016 in the uh, T-SQL support for native. For example, these are all the changes we made uh, for native compilation. Like for example, left join, auto join were not available as a native uh, call inside the native store procedures, right? So those things we have done. Uh, we have made changes for the tables. I mean, we support all collations and a bunch of changes. If you have run into such problems in 2014, I think I recommend highly that you take a step back and look at it. We have done management improvements, many, many improvements like that. Other thing is that the technology that we have in memory is available in Azure DB as well. You can use it. Uh, these are the limitations that I've shown you with a P1. These are the sizes available. So you don't even have to have a server on your side. You can just you know, get an Azure account and, and you can play with this technology. I think uh, this is pretty much it. I, I think, sorry I ran out of time, but uh, I, I just want to make sure that you understand that why in-memory technology can give you such a high performance that is no locking memory optimized structures and native compilation of the stored procedures, right? Very important and, uh, and, uh, and, and the combination of those things can give you amazing amount of performance. You can use uh, TempDB as a replacement for, sorry, in-memory OLTP as a replacement for TempDB in certain situations, ETLs and so on and so forth. So I recommend highly that you step back and take a look at which part of your workload can take advantage of this technology. Uh, with that, thank you so much for joining. Thank you very much, Sunil. It was an enlightening presentation, um, as always. Um, Thank you everybody for being here with us. Um, you will be able to 
review this session. Uh, the recording will be posted to uh, the archive page. If you look in the comments, I answered before a question with the links where you can find uh, the archive. And we also have a YouTube channel uh, where the um, session will be uploaded as well. So thank you very much and hope to see you next month in our next presentation regarding in-memory technologies. Have a wonderful day, everybody.